And uh, we will dismiss the children. And we will turn to Revelations chapter 9 this morning. Revelations 9, and uh, we begin our study this morning in verse 12. The story is told of a certain man who wanted to buy a house. And the man he wanted he wanted to buy it from wouldn't sell his house. And um, he couldn't afford a price either and after some discussion after much bargaining finally they came to an agreement that this man would sell his house for half the price that it was worth but under one condition and that is that he would retain ownership of one small nail protruding from just over the door so the deal was made. The house was sold. Several years went by, and the owner, the original owner, came back and he wanted to buy the house back. But the man wouldn't sell it back to him. So the original owner went out, he found a carcass of a dead dog, and he hung it from the single nail he still owned in that house. And soon the house was unlivable. The occupants had to move out of the house. They had to sell the house to him at great loss. And the moral of that story is if we leave the devil with even one small peg in our life, he will return to hang his rotting garbage on it and will make it unfit for Christian habitation. And that is how the devil is. He will start with one nail in our life, if he must. But always with the aim to corrupt the soul. Some time ago I read that and of course the statistics always come from the US because they have them, but that some $13 billion is stolen each year in the United States by shoplifting. One out of, out of 11 people admit to shoplift at one point or another. This study found that 75% of those who shoplift are adults. And the item, the amount on an average shoplift is just, well, it's between two and $200, but in most cases, it's just a small item. It's maybe two bucks. And what one might conclude, so what's the big deal? It's just shoplifting $2 worth. But if you think of professional robbers, they probably didn't start out that way. They started out with just a couple dollars, just one nail. That was it. That's all it took to corrupt the whole person. Satan is very persistent. He understands that he cannot corrupt the world with one sweep. He can't legalize abortion. He can't legalize homosexuality with just one sweep. He can't legalize drugs. So he has to start small. He has to corrupt one nail at a time. When we look at the most powerful nations on the earth today, and we look at some of the, of the way that they were corrupted, the path 
the journey towards corruption. First, the Christians were generally Christian. Christian textbooks. But then creeps in seemingly a harmless theory of evolution, which is more advanced thinking. And then prayer is taken out of schools. The Bibles are taken out of schools. Eventually, abortion becomes illegal. Homosexuality becomes illegal. Different forms of drugs become legal. And we see corruption begins to seep into a culture. And it begins to take root and it begins to harden the hearts of people to a point where they're almost unredeemable. And in Revelation, we see the extent to which Satan corrupts the world. And we see the hardness of heart. If you look in chapter 9 and verse 20, it says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, and which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And listen to this, verse 21, And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the direction that the world is headed. But Satan is on a leash. Satan does not have free will today. Satan has a big problem. It's the church. It's the church. Have you ever thought of it? That now with the pandemic that we've seen over the last year and a half, that it is the churches oftentimes that are the first that are to be closed. In some cases, you leave bars open, you leave other forms of, in society open, but the churches are the non-essential. And oftentimes, they're the ones that need to be closed first. They're not essential. The bride of Christ is not deemed essential. And so Satan needs the church out of the way. It's a problem. It's an issue for him. Years ago, when I was still a kid, we had some really aggressive dogs, German Shepherd dogs. They were just really aggressive. Everybody knew it. Nobody wanted to come to our house just on foot because they would have got attacked. And one day we had these guys that came in. I guess they didn't know that we had aggressive dogs. And they, they, they walked into the yard it was a mistake. We had like three German shepherds. They were, they were after them. And they, there was a dozer on the yard. And, and they started circling around the dozer. And the dogs were after it. But the dogs couldn't get to them because the dozer. They, they, they found the dozer that they could, they could find protection from. To hide behind or to crawl upon. And that is really, in a sense, we could say Satan is after the destruction of humanity. He's after your destruction. Destruction of the world, but he has a problem, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really, in a sense, this huge dozer that stands in front of Satan. And he's on a leash. He holds him. But the Bible says the day will come when the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, For the mystery of lawlessness. Notice the word lawlessness. What do you see in the world today? Lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Satan 
Satan is on a leash, but one day that leash will be greatly extended. And that will be when that which is in the way, in our picture that we had this morning is the dozer, when that is in the way, is taken out of the way, he will have freedom to unleash hell on earth. But the church that the world today, today sees as a problem, they're always a problem. They don't, illegal, they don't want, they stand against abortion. They stand against homosexuality. They stand against legalizing uh, drugs. They stand against all, they're, they're a problem. They need to be taken out. And one day, God will take them out. First Thessalonians 4 speaks of the trumpet that will sound and we will meet the Lord in the air. The Holy Spirit is where today? He is in you, right? As a Christian, he is in you. You are the problem because the Holy Spirit lives and resides and dwells in you and you need to be taken out of the way so that the enemy has free flow on the earth. When he who is in the way will be taken out of the way, his leash will be extended. We saw in our previous chapter that a key is given to the star that is fallen. If you look in verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen, which is probably Satan himself, from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like smoke of great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke of locusts came upon the earth. To them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power, and they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, any green thing or any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of scorpions when it strikes a man. In those days, man will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. That's what Satan would love to do today, but he can't. Because God restrains the enemy. God is in control today of the world. You might say that it seems the world is out of control. No, God is in control. And God will use the enemy. He will use Satan to bring judgment on the earth. If you look in the Old Testament, we see that God used a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to bring judgment in that case, it was upon his people who had turned away from the Lord. But what we see is that, that, that God uses, in some cases, evil for his good as his servant. He said, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. And God will use Satan to bring judgment, not on his people, but on the unbelieving people on those who have turned their back on Jesus Christ. And so chapter 8, verse 13, it says, there were three woes that are coming. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of three angels who are about to sound. So the unleashing or the key that was given to the star to, un to unlock this pit was one woe, and now there's two more to come. So let's continue reading in verse 12. It says, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million 
and I heard a number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. But their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So we see that the altar of incense has horns on each corner. And if you read, again, if you, as we saw before, if you look at what heaven looks like, the layout is the same as that of the, the tabernacle. It's the same layout. We see that. The altars that are there, we will see the, uh, the labor. We see the, the, the menorah, the showbread, the altar of incense. It's, it's kind of the same layout we see before God's throne. And in this case, we see that there is a voice that comes from the golden altar, which is before God, as we see here in verse 13. Now, it's a golden altar, sister, that has horns. If you look at Exodus chapter 30, and let me read it to you, verse 1, if you want to turn there with your Bible, um, where God gives the instruction on this altar that is to be built. In Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1, it says, You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold, and you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides, and there will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. So that was the altar of incense. And that is where this voice is coming from. Now, as we saw, the altar in Bible times was very important. You had the altar of brass, which was outside which was the altar of judgment. That is where your sins would be atoned for. And it was that altar that was burning where the high priest would take the coals from and he would bring that to the altar of incense, which was the altar of prayer. But it was considered to be an altar of mercy. See, the altar of judgment was outside. It was when you came through the door. Jesus says, I am the door. You would come through one door in the tabernacle, that fence that was surrounded, and Jesus says, I am the door. You come through that door and you repent of your sins, the altar of brass. And then after that was the, 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 the labor of water. Jesus says, you know, he, he cleanses you from all sins. It's, it's representative of that labor. But it's only after you've been at the altar of brass that you can really come to the altar of incense, the altar of prayer. The altar of prayer is ignited by the altar of brass. See, God does not hear your prayers if you are not a Christian. The only prayer that God hears if you are an unbeliever is the, the prayer for repentance. There's no evidence in the scripture that God listens and hears the prayers of the godless. But he does hear the prayers of the Christians. Those who have been through the altar of brass who have their sins forgiven and then they come to the altar of incense which was represented as really an altar of refuge an altar of mercy we see that people in the old testament 
would flee to the altar of incense and they would hold on to the horns of the altar of incense really as an act of mercy, pleading for mercy. We see Adonijah. When he heard that Absalom or, or Solomon had become king, he was afraid for his life and he fled to the altar of incense and he held on to the horns and his life was spared. But now we see that this altar of mercy has become an altar of judgment. We saw in our previous chapter, really in chapter 8, that the angel took the, the, the censer at the altar of, of incense, put coals in it, and he flung it on the earth. And judgment came to the earth. So even the altar of mercy has now become an altar of judgment. And a voice, look at verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Judgment is now coming forth from the altar of mercy. The day will come when mercy will end. Yes, God will, in the midst of that, there will still be kind of streaks of mercy, if you would. God will still save many in during this period of time, but it will be an act of judgment. If you look at the word voice in Greek that came forth, it's, it's a singular. It's one voice. It's the voice of God. You know, the Bible says that God will not strive with men forever. God has been merciful for such a long time. And now that mercy is come to an end. And judgment comes. Look in verse 14. It says, And saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So, this altar of incense now says, no mercy, but rather release these four angels at the river Euphrates. Now, if they are tied up, they're bound up, there's, there's only one reason why you would tie someone up, and that is to keep them from doing something, right? It seems that God, through history, has bound up demons. We see that in Jude 6, that he bound up demons who sinned long ago during the times of, of Noah. They're really bad guys. He's tied them all up. And he's holding them. Some are in hell. The Bible says some, it seems, are at the river Euphrates, whatever that means. But he's got them bound up. So the demons that we're dealing with today are moderates. They're kind of like not the worst. But during judgment, God is going to release the worst of the worst. And there's four of them who are bound at the river Euphrates. And that would ask, we would ask the question, so why would God have them bound over in that area? It seems if we look at the scriptures, scriptures if we look at um, the book of Esther, we look at Satan, uh, we see that, for example, there was uh, the prince over the king of Persia. It seems that there are certain demons who are allocated to guard or certain areas or certain cities or certain countries. There are certain demons that are stationed in those areas, and they're over that particular region. And it seems that there are certain demons that were over the area of the Euphrates. Because that is really the area of the Garden of Eden. And that is where misery began. It began at the Garden of Eden. It is the ancient landmark of Babylon. That's where the first sin was committed. It's where the first murder was committed. It was where the first grave was dug. It was a place where the first organized revolt against God, Babylon, the Tower of Babylon. 
There was where the first war was fought, the co first confederation of war, we could <clears throat> say, the five kings that came together to fight against God's people. There was the first dictatorship came from this place. And even today, if you look at the world today, it's the most godless place even on the, on the earth today. And it seems that these demons will be unleashed from this place. They will be untied. Verse 15, it says, So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. It shows that God has set the world in motion and that he is in control. The day, the month, the year has been set by the Lord. Even during the worst of the tribulation, Satan can only do what God permits. If you look at the world today, and we look at governments, we look, look at politics, you know, we could get really concerned about maybe the direction that things are headed globally. But when you think of it, that politicians and even the Antichrist that will come on the scene later on are really puppets in the hand of God. But God is fully in control. Someone likened politicians to a log floating down the river. And the ants and the worms that are in the log think that they're steering the log. And so it is that in reality, ultimately, God is in control. And in this case, one third of mankind is killed. Now, in the previous plague, plague we saw that man was unable to die. But now we see that one-third of humanity is killed. In chapter 6 and verse 8, we saw that a quarter of humanity was killed by the opening of the fourth seal. So by this time, over half of the population have died from two plagues alone. Can you imagine trying to bury billions of people in a very short period of time? It'll be a problem. It'll be a massive problem. Getting rid of all the corpses. Verse 16, it says, Now the number of the army of the horsemen, who is 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of a fiery red, hyacinth blue, and the sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. These four angels that are released at the Euphrates River bring an army of 200 million. And of course, naturally, we ask the questions, who are these 200 million? Does this speak of a natural or a supernatural army? Is it an army of men or an army of demons? You know, 200 million, even the largest military today is, you know, just over a million, or China, maybe two million. But these are 200 million. China, in 1965, boasted that they had the ability to come up with an army of 200 million men. Now, we know that in the last day, that the enemy will come from the east, and they'll make war, and it will all culminate at, the, at, the, uh, at Armageddon. But I, I think, personally that this is probably 
speaking of demons, there's different views. Some think, think that it's, this, this is really a picture of modern warfare. We see that they were, had breastplates and, and uh, uh, you know, fire and brimstone is coming out of their mouths. It's like cannons shooting out. I don't know. It could be that John is trying to somehow describe what he saw. He saw modern warfare and he tried to describe that. It's possible. But if I look at the rest of the book of Revelations and I look at the wrath that is unleashed, I see most of it is, comes directly from the Lord himself. Yes, we will see that armies will come marching in from the east towards Towards, towards Israel and they'll make warfare and they'll try to wipe it out once and for all but it says that, that Jesus will come at that point with the brightness of his coming and he will just annihilate that army entirely but I think it's probably demons 200 million of them just coming to bring an increased torment on humanity and really at this point to kill a third of them if you look at the colors, they're red, sulfur yellow. If you look at, 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 at fire, you know, it's red, sulfur yellow, it's, 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 it's a yellowish fire. Hyacinth can be from blue to black, it's the color of smoke. Really, we can see that these, these are all colors of hell. Red, yellow, dark, blue, or black. And, and what is the response from the people after all of this? Imagine the previous plague, locusts came and they settled on humans, they stung them like scorpions. Can you imagine, you see the locusts coming and they're flying, there's a swarm of them, but they're demons. And they're coming, and it's like the people are thinking they're coming for the grass, they're coming for the herbs, but all of a sudden they just come and they latch onto humans. And you can't see the person because he's covered with them. And they have these stings of scorpions, and they're stinging them, thousands of stings. I once was stung by bees, African bees, and I had a, I don't know, like a hundred plus stings. And I didn't feel good. I can tell you that. I didn't feel good. I ended up, you know, in the hospital, at the clinic. But can you imagine being stung over and over by these guys? And you can't die from it. You want to die. You seek death, but you can't die. It's like death has taken a vacation. There's these plagues and there's this torment. And you would think that people would fall on their faces and they would repent. Look in verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works, of their hands. That they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Today, there is a preaching of the gospel that goes forth. It goes forth in church, it goes forth on the air, it goes forth in all forms of platforms that we have out today, but it's going forth in the world, and many people are getting saved. But it would seem that less and less people are getting saved as the world becomes more and more hardened by sin. I wonder today if one of the instruments that can be a great source of blessing can also be a curse. And that is this device. If you think of it, if someone is prompted by the Holy Spirit and they're convicted 
they quickly go do this. And pretty soon, that voice, that conviction is numbed. Because they can fill their minds with a thousand other things that are right at their disposal. But 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. If you were out and you were sitting, you didn't have this device. So what did you do? You were thinking. You were thinking. But now someone does a thinking for you. And you just watch them think. And you don't think anymore. And so the idea of controlling humanity has just multiplied so many times. It's so much easier. And it seems that humanity just becomes harder and harder as sin is rampant all around and less and less people are being saved. One day God is just going to take the Christians out altogether and then he's going to try to save everyone he can save. And that is by unleashing hell on earth. But always with that intent to save as many as he can, to snatch them out. But those who are hardened will just become harder. And we see that no amount of torment will cause them to repent. And they hold on to these things. There's five things that they hold on to. One is idolatry. Man is inclined to worship something, right? We see that all around us, the Mayan ruins that are left all over this country are testimony to that. Even years ago, people would didn't have the gospel, they would worship something else. They would worship their sun god, their moon god. And people to this day, they still worship something. Everyone worships something. If you don't worship the true God, you worship something else. It's a new age or reincarnation or, you know, this guidance by this crystal ball or whatever it is. But they're worshiping something. And then they wouldn't let go of murders. You know, we live in a small country with few people, but even then we have like 140 murders a year in this country. It's like man is unable to live at peace with one another. We're so sparsely populated in this country and they still kill each other. Now think about it, that one of the seals had the ability to take peace away from the earth. So it's just going to be multiplied. And then there was the third thing was sorceries. The word where we get the word pharma, uh, pharmacia, where we get the word pharmacy from. It's associated with taking drugs. will be rampant in those days. Immorality. The word pornea or pornography we get from that. It's sex outside of God's design. We see that today will just increase. They won't let go of that. They won't. That they will hold on to that. And there's theft. It's the fifth one. Corruption at every level of society. No more justice. I think during this time, the idea of coming up with the number 666 will be just this great idea. This is amazing. Finally, we have some form of relief where we can just put this Whatever it's going to be, some mark or some chip or something on in each human being, we can track everyone and we can see who is the bad guy. And people just flock for it and say, this is, this is the greatest idea and it will be the Antichrist behind it. It will be deception. It will be Satan. When you look at what's going on in the world today, it, it certainly feels like we're coming awfully close to this time, doesn't it? I think the world today is better prepared to go this direction than it's ever been before. I know people in the past, if you look at the Great Plague or the Black Plague, you look at World War One, World War Two. I'm certain people thought this is this is really coming towards the end. But but when we look at where are we in God's timetable, we don't look at the United States, we don't look at World War Two, we don't look at Germany, we don't look at 
what we look at is Israel. Israel really is the apple of God's eye, whether we like it or not. Some people hate that. They say, well, I, you know, but it, it, it is. It is. And where is Israel today? That really determines where we are in God's timetable. And the fact that the Bible has always said that Israel will be dispersed, as we saw in 1970, they were dispersed, and that they would be regathered in the end of times, in the end days. The Bible clearly says it multiple times that they must be regathered into their land. Back in 19, or during World War it, II, it didn't happen. They were not gathered in the land. Today, Israel is gathered back into the land. There's no prophecy today that needs to be fulfilled for Christ to come back, for the rapture to occur. There's nothing in the way. I think Romans tells us that there must be this, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, there's this last Gentile that needs to be saved. When that happens, God knows who that is. God knows how many there are that need to be saved. Then the time of grace is over. See, when God came, he, he chose the nation of Israel to be a light and salt in the Old Testament. It was, it was really Israel's time. They were to de-evangelize and to be salt and light to the earth didn't do a very good job of that but but then Jesus came and Israel rejected Jesus and he says because you reject me and because you did not know the day of your visitation he says judgment will fall on you you will be they were dispersed but the time of the Gentiles had come in and that is the time that we are today but that time is coming to an end when that last Gentile is saved and then the clock goes back to the Jew for one last time, for seven more years. And I think we see that time, that gap coming really close today. And so what should we do in the light of that? Well, what did Jesus do when he came into this earth? He said, repent. What did John say who came before Jesus? He said, repent. What did the Old Testament prophets say when they saw judgment was coming? They said, repent. And I think that is the message today. That we as Christians should, should herald forth loud and clear. And that is the message of repentance. Get right with God while there is still time. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, for mercy. We thank you, Lord, for grace. We thank you, Lord, that today there is still time. Today is the day of salvation. We don't know about tomorrow, but today is the day when you still receive us. When we come to you and we ask for you to, re re to forgive us, you do so immediately. When we see in the Old Testament, we saw that they had to wait. The high priest would go once a year. He would go in while the crowds or the nation was standing before the tabernacle, the high priest would go in one time, once a year, and he would, would, would sacrifice an animal, and he would sprinkle that blood unto the Ark of the Covenant. And then the sins of the nation was forgiven. Or we could say it was appeased for one year. And then he had to come again. But today, it's not a yearly thing. It's a daily thing. We can come to you at any time. And our sins are forgiven immediately. Because of the finished work of the cross. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Father, that this earth is not our home. This is just a preparation for what is to come. And that is eternity. And we thank you for that. We just pray, Lord, help us to live worthy of that. In Jesus' name, amen.